Welcome to the Queensland Storyteller. Each week we bring you a short story by an Australian writer. My name's Kim Dodsworth. Today's story is written by Henry Lawson. It's called Going Blind. I met him in the full and plenty dining rooms. It was a cheap place in the city with good beds upstairs let at one shilling per night. Board and residence for respectable single men, 15 shillings per week. I was a respectable single man then. I boarded and resided there. I boarded at a greasy little table in the greasy little corner under the fluffy little staircase in the hot and greasy little dining room or restaurant downstairs. They called it dining rooms, but it was only one room, and there wasn't half enough room in it to work your elbows when the seven little tables and 49 chairs were occupied. There was not room for an ordinary-sized steward to pass up and down between the tables, but our waiter was not an ordinary-sized man. He was a living skeleton in miniature. We handed the soup and the roast beef one and roast slam one, corned beef and cabbage one, veal and pickled pork one or two or three as the case may be, and the tea and coffee and the various kinds of pudding. We handed over each other and dodged the drops as well as we could. The very hot and very greasy little kitchen was adjacent, and it contained the bathroom and other conveniences behind screens of whitewashed boards. I resided upstairs in a room where there were five beds and one washstand, one candlestick with a very short bit of soft yellow candle in it, the back of a hairbrush with about a dozen bristles in it and half a comb, the big tooth end with nine and a half teeth at irregular distances apart. He was a typical bushman. He seemed as if he had forgotten to grow old and die out with this old colonial school to which he belonged. His name was Jack Gunther, he said, and he'd come to Sydney to try to get something done to his eyes. He had a portmanteau, a carpet bag, some things in a three-bushel bag and a tin box, and I sat beside him on his bed and struck up an acquaintance, and he told me all about it. First he asked me would I mind shifting around to the other side, as he was rather deaf in that ear. He'd been kicked on the side of the head by a horse, he said, and had been a little dull of hearing on that side ever since. He was as good as blind. I can see the people near me, he said, but I can't make out their faces. I can just make out the pavement and the houses close at hand, and all the rest is a sort of white blur. He looked up. That ceiling is kind of white, ain't it? And this, tapping the wall and putting his nose close to it, is a sort of green, ain't it? The ceiling might have been whiter. The prevalent tints of the wallpaper had originally been blue and red. But it was mostly green enough now. A damp, rotten green. But I was ready to swear that the ceiling was snow and that the walls were green as grass if it would make him feel more comfortable. His sight began to get bad about six years before, he said. He didn't take much notice of it at first, and then he saw a quack who made his eyes worse. He had already the manner of the blind, the touch in every finger, and even the gentleness in his speech. He had a boy down with him, a sort of cousin of his, and the boy saw him round. "'I'll have to be sending that youngster back,' he said. "'I think I'll send him home next week. He'll be picking up and learning too much down here.' I happened to know the district he came from, and we would sit by the hour and talk about the country and chaps by the name of this and chaps by the name of that, drovers mostly, whom we had met or had heard of. He asked me if I'd ever heard of a chap by the name of Joe Scott, a big sandy complexion chap who might be droving. He was his brother, or at least his half-brother, but he hadn't heard of him for years. He'd last heard of him at Blackwall in Queensland. He might have gone overland to Western Australia with Tyson's cattle to the new country. We talked about grubbing and fencing and digging and droving and shearing, all about the bush, and it all came back to me as we talked. I can see it all now, he said once, in an abstracted tone, seeming to fix his helpless eyes on the wall opposite. But he didn't see the dirty blind wall, nor the dingy window, nor the skimpy little bed, nor the greasy washstand. He saw the dark blue ridges in the sunlight, the grassy sidings and flats, the creek with clumps of she-oak here and there, the course of the willow-fringed river below, the distant peaks and ranges fading away into a lighter azure, the granite ridge in the middle distance and the rocky rises, the stringy bark and the apple tree flats, the shrubs and the sunlit plains and all. I could see it too, plainer than I ever did. He'd been to the hospital several times. The doctors don't say they can cure me, he said, 
They say they might be able to improve my sight and hearing, but it would take a long time. Anyway, the treatment would improve my general health. They know what's the matter with my eyes. And he explained it as well as he could. I wish I'd seen a good doctor when my eyes first began to get weak, but young chaps are always careless over things. It's harder to get cured of anything when you're done growing. He was always hopeful and cheerful. If the worst comes to the worst, he said, there's things I can do where I come from. I might do a bit of wool sorting, for instance. I'm a pretty fair expert. Or else, when they're weeding out, I could help. I'd just have to sit down and they'd bring the sheep to me, and I'd feel the wool and tell them what it was. Being blind improves the feeling, you know. He had a packet of portraits, but he couldn't make them out very well now. They were sort of blurred to him, but I described them, and he told me who they were. That's a girl of mine, he said with reference to one, a jolly, good-looking bush girl. I got a letter from her yesterday. I managed to scribble something, but I'll get you, if you don't mind, to write something more I want to put in on another piece of paper and address an envelope for me. Darkness fell quickly upon him now, or rather, the sort of white blur increased and closed in. But his hearing was better, he said, and he was glad of that and still cheerful. I thought it natural that his hearing should improve as he went blind. One day, he said he didn't think he'd bother going to the hospital any more. He reckoned he'd get back to where he was known. He'd stayed down too long already, and the stuff wouldn't stand it. He was expecting a letter that didn't come. I was away for a couple of days, and when I came back, he'd been shifted out of the room and had a bed in an angle of the landing on top of the staircase, with people brushing against him and stumbling over his things all day on their way up and down. I felt indignant, thinking that the house being full, the boss had taken advantage of the bushman's helplessness and good nature to put him there. But he said that he was quite comfortable. I can get a whiff of air here, he said. Going in next day, I thought for a moment that I had dropped suddenly back into the past and into a bush dance, for there was a concertina going upstairs. He was sitting on the bed with his legs crossed and a new cheap concertina on his knee, and his eyes turned to the patch of ceiling as if it were a piece of music and he could read it. Trying to knock a few tunes into my head, he said, with a brave smile. In case the worst comes to the worst. He tried to be cheerful, but seemed worried and anxious. The letter hadn't come. I thought of the many blind musicians in Sydney, and I thought of the Bushman's chance, standing at a corner, swanking a cheap concertina, and I felt very sorry for him. I went out with a vague idea of seeing someone about the matter, and getting something done for the Bushman, of bringing a little influence to his assistance but I suddenly remembered that my clothes were worn out, my hat in a shocking state, my boots burst, and that I owed for a week's board and lodging was likely to get thrown out at any moment myself, and so I was not in a position to go where there was influence. When I went back to the restaurant, there was a long, gaunt, sandy-complexioned bushman sitting by Jack's side. Jack introduced him as his brother, who had returned unexpectedly to his native district and had followed him to Sydney. The brother was rather short with me at first, and seemed to regard the restaurant people, all of us in fact, in the light of spielers, who wouldn't hesitate to take advantage of Jack's blindness if he left him a moment, and he looked ready to knock down the first man who stumbled across Jack or over his luggage, but that soon wore off. Jack was going to stay with Joe at the coffee palace for a few weeks, and then go up country, he told me. He was excited and happy. His brother's manner towards him was as if Jack had just lost his wife, or boy, or someone very dear to him. He wouldn't allow him to do anything for himself, nor try to, not even lace up his boots. He seemed to think he was thoroughly helpless. And when I saw him pack up Jack's things and help him at the table, and fix his tie and collar with his great muscular hands, which trembled all the time with grief and gentleness, and make Jack sit down on the bed whilst he got a cab and carried the traps down to it, and take him downstairs as if he were made of thin glass and settle the landlord, then I knew Jack was all right. We had a drink together, Joe, Jack, the cabman and I. Joe was very careful to hand Jack the glass, and Jack made a joke about it for Joe's benefit. He swore he could see a glass yet, and Joe laughed, but he looked extra trouble the next moment. I felt their grips on my hand for five minutes after we parted. And that concludes our story for this week, Going Blind by Henry Lawson. I'm Kim Dodsworth. Thanks for joining us. I'm looking forward to bringing you more stories from the Queensland Storyteller this time next week.